Please be seated. Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Good morning, Father. The entire law of God and everything that our Lord Jesus taught can be summarized in one word, love. But what do we do if someone betrays our love? What will you do if the loved one sins against you and really hurts you? What do you do if someone you love made you, know, made you feel disrespected and unloved? Or what if they did something that's really bad? How do we love them in that circumstance? Today, the Word of God is going to teach us something very important called fraternal correction. Fraternal correction. So turn with me to today's gospel, according to Matthew, verses 15, chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. We're going to begin in verse 15. Jesus said to his disciples, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. Okay, so let's, let's stop there. Jesus says that this teaching applies when your brother sins against you. Then you need to go and speak to, to them. Wow. So if your fellow believer sins against you, what do you need to do? You need to go to him. If someone spreads gossip about you, what are you supposed to do? You go to them. If someone cheats you on a business deal, takes your money, you go to her, you know? Or have you ever tried that? It's not easy. That's what Jesus is asking us to do, though. Now, there are times when we will have to confront and correct a brother or a sister with faith and with love. Question, when is the right time to correct a member of God's family who has hurt you or sinned against you? Well, in the first reading from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 8, God says this, check it out. If I tell the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade the wicked from his way, the wicked shall die for his guilt, but I will hold you responsible for his death. Like, oh, wow. In other words, if we fail in fraternal correction, then God will hold us responsible also. Wow. We got to take this seriously then. So the most difficult and painful obligation of love is called fraternal correction. To correct somebody that hurt you or did something wrong. So when are you obligated to correct someone? I'm going to give, present to you five conditions that determine if you are under a moral obligation to correct someone. Condition number one, when the wrongdoing or a sin is a serious matter. In other words, this is something serious, not just like any little thing. But if it's serious, okay, condition one. Condition number two, when the person is unwilling to correct themselves. A lot of times people say, I messed up, I'm sorry. Okay, they corrected themselves, right? But if that person is not willing to correct themselves, that's the second condition. Third condition is when the correction will not bring greater harm to that person. Okay? So it's not a ca causing more harm to them. It's about bringing them to reconcile. The fourth condition is when the risk from correcting them does not outweigh the benefits. For example, if you think a person when you correct them, will take out a gun and shoot you, then of course you're not required to correct, right? Because they're going to hurt you. So, But if, if they're going to receive it pretty good, then that's a condition when you should. Now the fifth and final condition is when you have the ability to correct a person firmly, yet also with love. If you have the ability to do so, then you probably need to do so. Now, if all of these five conditions apply, then you are morally obligated to correct someone, to fraternal correction. Of course, if you yourself are too injured or too angry to talk to that person, maybe it's better that you just pray by something like this. 
Lord Jesus, I am very angry and I feel very injured by that person. However, I ask you to help me to begin a process of reconciliation. Amen. Amen. So at least you're praying for the grace so that you can even approach them to correct. Now, I know that the decision to confront someone you love is never easy. Yet listen carefully. The fear of offending someone or the fear of they're going to get angry is not a legitimate excuse. In other words, if those five conditions are met, then fraternal correction is an obligation of love. For example, I remember the dad of a friend of mine who was an alcoholic. When she was, as she was growing up, she was very afraid to confront him or say anything. But when she, you know, got in her teen years, she, she got pretty courageous. And she confronted her, she confronted her dad's drinking. You know, dad, that's not right. You got to stop that. You know, so, and she did so in love and she did so in private. Now, when someone is on a path of self-destruction, love has to correct them. You can't just, well, let them just jump off the cliff. Well, no, it's our job to go and correct them. In fact, in today's gospel, our Lord Jesus gave us four steps, a four-step process to correct other persons that we love. Okay, so let's go back to the gospel. Step number one in bringing fraternal correction is found in Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now the key word here is between you and him, what does it say? Alone. This commandment of our Lord Jesus is probably the most disobeyed of all the commandments. Why? Because it's much easier to talk about them than to talk to them. It really is. Or some people will say, well, that's none of my business. I'll just, I'll just gossip about it instead. Well, no. I invite you to look around, to look around your circle of friends, to look around at your place of employment, your family. You see a lot of gossiping? See a lot of backbiting? insinuations well the next time a person comes to you saying something negative about someone else this is what you can say please repeat after me don't talk to me don't, don't talk to me talk to them by yourself talk to them by, by yourself. yourself these words can help you end gossip don't talk to me talk to them by yourself that's what Jesus is commanding us to do. That's what we should do. Now, if you are dealing, for example, with an alcoholic, you might have to adapt or adopt a professional intervention strategy. Don't be afraid, though. We have to overcome our resistance to fraternal correction. Now, if they listen to you and they repent and they ask for forgiveness, that's awesome. You want a brother back into God's grace. You've gotten your brother or sister back into the rhythm of God's love. But if they don't listen to you, then our natural tendency is to like bolt. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm calling it quits. The hell with you. No. But God says, don't give up. Keep trying. Step number two is found in verse 16. If he does not listen... Take one or two brothers along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. And he implies that you should establish a basis for a possible legal action within the church, which always requires two or three witnesses witnesses. Now, practically speaking, it means that you seek the wise counsel of others. You maybe begin by organizing a support network of relatives or close friends to say, can you guys come with me so we can together go talk to him because he's not listening to me. For example, Alcoholics Anonymous and also Al-Anon, they can help you prepare a plan of action and they can help you 
make an arrangement for that person to go to a rehabilitation program. We have sent people here from San Pedro to rehabilitation programs in other places in Belize, even in Mexico, we have sent them. So you, we're here to help you also help them. Now, with an alcoholic, you have to be very firm and very clear. You can't enable their behavior anymore. Family members usually are enablers. You cannot enable that behavior anymore. That means don't cover up for the alcoholic's inabilities to go to work. Don't pay bills that they should pay. Don't do stuff that they should do. Let them fall flat. Let them fall. And then when they're ready, you help pick them up. Now, if the person won't listen even to this group of people that you bring to them, then once again, our natural tendency is to say, well, that's it. That's it. I'm just going to give up on them. The hell with them. Well, no. God says, don't give up. Now comes step number three. Verse 17 says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. So at this stage, then you call me. You have to involve the pastor, the priest, even the bishop. Don't call me on step number one. Call me on step number three. You got to do the first two steps. You know, why? Why do we call then the church or, the, or me or the priest? Why? Because Jesus has given his church his own authority. And he says today, what she binds on earth is bound in heaven. And of course, the goal is ultimately to heal and restore that person into right communion with you, with the family, with the church. Now, the next step, then comes step number four, the last one. Verse 17, then says, If he or she refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, now Jesus is pretty good with Gentile tax collectors. He ain't with them. But when a person refuses to listen to the church, then they have, what it means that their heart is, has become really hard. They've fallen into like full-blown self-righteousness. That means there is no repentance in their heart at this time. So to treat him as a Gentile or tax collector basically is a Jewish idiom that means to separate from them. At this stage, God gives you permission to physically separate from that person. To separate from them might mean asking a grown son or daughter who keeps bringing drugs into your house to leave your home. It might mean that you stop calling them on the phone because they're just cursing you all the time. It might mean getting a restraining order for a husband who is threatening his wife. And that means that you have to recognize the physical and spiritual harm they are doing maybe to you or to others. And you have to physically separate from that. And sometimes, you know, you have to physically sever that relationship for a period of time. But here's the key point. To physically separate from them does not mean that you do not love them. It does not mean that you are giving up on them. You never give up on them. You never stop loving them. You simply have to love them from a distance until their behavior changes. This means that you have to love them through prayer. Through prayer. Maybe that's God calling us right now. That's what you have to do through prayer. Now, when Christians are gathered together for the purpose of prayer, Jesus taught us something in today's gospel. He says, Jesus guarantees us, I'm there with you. Our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19 to 20, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which you are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Wow. In the time of Jesus, the rabbis used to have a saying, if two persons sit together and the words of the law are spoken between them, the Shekinah rests between them. Shekinah is a Hebrew word that means the visible glory of God's presence. It's like God's glory is there. What well, Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. In other words, Jesus himself assumes the place of God's divine Shekinah presence. Jesus is God's glory. 
This means that when Christians are gathered together in his name, Jesus is guaranteeing, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. But Jesus made a conditional statement in verse 19. He said, if two of you agree, the word agree in the original Greek is symphoneo, symphoneo. Sim means together with, phoneo means a sound or a voice. That's where we get the word symphony from. A symphony is basically an agreement of many sounds of all the different instruments. In other words, Jesus is basically saying, look, if two of you pray in symphony, in street lingo, this means if two of you are in tune with each other, then your prayer will reach God's ear like a beautiful symphony. And our Heavenly Father will heal that symphony and bless you for it. Our Heavenly Father really likes it when we come together to pray. It sounds to Him like a beautiful symphony. But Jesus made a, you know, uh, that conditional uh, statement, you know. So when's the last time that you prayed together as a family at your house? When's the last time you prayed together at your house? Could it be that maybe you're not seeing more results from your prayers because maybe you're not praying together at your house? And yet Jesus guarantees us that when we gather together in his name, I'm with you, he says, I'm there. No, for many people, that's sort of hard to understand because their concept of God is like that God is somewhere else, but not like right here. But Jesus is telling us, no, I'm not just over there. I'm also right here in your midst, guaranteed if you gather in my name. And at that moment, our Lord Jesus becomes like a link between heaven and us. A, living, a link between God our Father and you. So my prayer for you this day is this. That you may not be afraid to love, even when that requires fraternal correction. May you gather with others and pray in agreement like a beautiful, beautiful symphony in God's presence. And may you realize that Jesus is in our midst right now, right here. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end.